today's speaker, as you've heard, is Ori Nir, who was the speaker 10 years ago. He's fluent in Hebrew and Arabic. He covered Palestinian affairs for Haaretz during the first Intifada and in the early years of the Oslo Accords for Haaretz. Uh, he was the Washington correspondent of Haaretz and of the Forward. And uh, he will talk to us again today on Israel, Palestine, what happened to peace, and what's happening in Israel today. So we'll welcome Ari Nir. So um, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, my good good friend Barbara, um, and again, happy anniversary to everyone. Um, a little bit before I came here today, I had a, a kind of a medical procedure. Uh, I'm still, I think, under uh, the influence of, of a uh, local anesthetic, so uh, which is supposed to wear off now about now so if you see something strange you know that's uh, <laughs> um now that i have your compassion and pity i can uh, go ahead and, uh, um so as, as barbara mentioned last time when i was here 10 years ago uh I, I went narrow and i spoke about the israeli elections that were just about to take place I actually uh, went and, and looked back at my um talk from that time and and it was it was narrow We've had about a thousand uh, Israeli elections since then. Actually, not a thousand. I counted it was seven. I, I thought that we had more. And um, so to, today, I thought I'll go a little broader and I'll talk about something more thematic, which would give you an idea of the kind of challenges that um, our friends at Israel's Peace Now movement and we here at Americans for Peace Now have been facing the kind of challenges we've had to deal with um, in the past let's say couple of decades uh, with the kind of attitude uh, that israelis as an, an as an extension american jews had toward uh peace political peace um so and i thought that that could serve as a kind of an appetizer uh for a conversation that hopefully we'll have uh later on so um, we'll do a quick association game, don't think, blurt out. When I ask you what first comes to mind when I say a Hebrew word? Hebrew word. Good, thank you. I actually, it's the right one, yes. I, I spoke uh, to a, a different kind of crowd uh, a while ago and people were kind of and, and came up with all sorts of, you know, it was a, a crowd of, um, uh, for, anyway, university. Um, <laughs> so, um, shalom, and and shalom in the context of a political peace, okay, um, a diplomatic peace, if you will, has really always been a kind of a staple uh, of Israeli politics, of Israeli political campaigns. Um, this picture that I have here is from 1996, the year that Netanyahu. Uh, won elections running against uh, Shimon Peres at the time. And uh, he too used it. Uh, the slogan was um, Osim Shalom Batuach, making um, uh, safe or secure peace. Okay, he was for secure peace. So, but still he had peace in his election campaign. Um, and this idea of peace is a, as a, again, as a promise, as a as hope, uh, as a desired goal. Um, and, and yes, coupled with security and, and, and for some other parties, equality and, and uh, prosperity and so on, was really a staple of Israeli election campaigns. Likud, Netanyahu's party, used it for the last time in that election campaign when he won, and then it evaporated. And later on, after the Intifada of the, the, the Second Intifada, the start of the Second Intifada in the year 2000, it has completely evaporated from any election campaign of really any um, at least Zionist uh, Israeli political party. And the, uh, the shift came, I think, with, with this event, which I'm, I'm sure that many of you remember, 
the lynch of two Israeli soldiers in Ramallah, uh, where a young Palestinian showed his bloody hands to the crowd. Um, and after that, there was a, a, a narrative uh, in Israeli society took place where when people talked about peace, uh, again, political peace, uh, were viewed as naive, this kind of peace was viewed as risky. Uh, you were kind of a sucker if you were talking about, about peace. Netanyahu at some point uh, adopted a uh, slogan where he's, which, which turned into a bumper sticker in Israel, which said, Shalom ken, Freier lo. Peace, yes, but, not, but I'm not gonna be a sucker, but we're not going, not, not in, a, in a way that will make us into suckers. Freier, if you know in Israeli, <laughs> It's a, originally a Yiddish word, uh, which really denotes the most low kind of, of, of sucker uh, that, that and nobody wants to, to be that in, in Israeli culture, in Israeli society. Uh, people later on viewed it as something that was really non-viable and, and not achievable. Um, there was a, a point in time uh, during the Olmert Abbas negotiations in 2006-2002 um, where Israeli and Palestinian leaders, negotiators really came close to a, uh, an agreement. They were, they were quite close um, and that was the good news. The bad news was that um, the failed negotiations at that time reaffirmed uh, the adage uh, that uh, Prime Minister Barak made after the uh, Camp David negotiations in the year 2000, when he said, ain't partner, there's no partner. The, we, we do not have a partner in the Palestinians. Um, and since then, uh, really there was no serious diplomacy between Israel and the Palestinians. Um, and, um, I looked at, I'm sorry, this was not, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I, I looked at, at statistics which showed that um, 58 of Palestinians and 43% of Israelis are actually under the age of 24. So they, they don't remember a time when there were negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. Furthermore, I looked also, I tried to think how many Israelis and Palestinians remember uh, a time before the occupation. So in order to gauge that, you have to think not about people who were born between 1967, but about people who were old enough to understand what was going on politically, right? So let's say age 10, you know, something like that. Well, okay, so 3% of Palestinians, in Gaza it's even lower than percent are um, uh, would have been 10 in 1967 or were 10 at the age of 10 in Israel it's higher it's, it's 11 percent but because we had this very very large influx of uh, aliyah of, of immigrants from the former Soviet Union in the 1990s it is safe to assume that about a million people maybe more were not there in 1967 so in, in Israel too I think it's in the in the single digits, maybe, I don't know, 8%, I'm just throwing something like that. Um, okay. Um, since 2009 then, as I, as I said before, under Netanyahu, um, no serious negotiations. There was a weakening of the Palestinian Authority. Um, settlement construction has really taken a, a major um, uh, uh, oomph. And while Netanyahu at some points uh, during his uh, premiership played, paid lip service to uh, the two-state solution, in practice was uh, pursuing policies that impeded the two-state solution. Um, he also adopted a policy of what he calls in outside in, in other words, making peace with the Arab, with Arab countries first, and telling people that maybe that would 
uh, inspire or lead to peace with the Palestinians later on, which I don't think he's really sincere about, but that was his kind of strategy. And that's how he, he, he managed to also uh, placate, I, I think, um, uh, people both in Israel and outside who were pushing for peace with the Palestinians. Um, and <laughs> to add to this, he was having um, indirect negotiations, not over a peace agreement, but uh, over managing the managing of the Gaza Strip with Hamas that leads Gaza further um, 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 delegitimizing the authority, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Um, what was the impact on Israeli public opinion? Um, sharp decline in support for a two-state solution. There are various numbers, and I'm not going to bother you with them, but if you look at the, at the graphs, they're all, you know, really sharp decline. Um, a steady increase in the conviction that Israeli-Palestinian peace is not only unattainable, but is actually undesirable. And mainly undesirable because of the um, security issue. If you look at the photo that I put here, it's a photo that was taken from the hills of the West Bank, looking westward to Bidgurion Airport, and um, the nightmare scenario that was that Israelis, many Israelis will uh, will tell you is, you know, we give them back the West Bank. We're going to have uh, rockets like we have from Gaza firing on Bidgurion Airport and the entire. Uh, coastal um, plain. Um, as I said before, peace was equated in, in the eyes of, of most Israelis with weakness, with naivete, uh, with being a sucker, um, and so on and so forth. And um, and also uh, the, the issue of the security risk, uh, as as I as I mentioned. Um, and now I come to the challenge that I talked about earlier for uh, the, the peace camp in general and for our movement in, in particular. Um, peace as a, as a concept, uh, as a concept that denotes diplomacy toward, um, toward the settlement with the, with the Palestinians um, has really suffered a, a, a dramatic devaluation. Um, no more peace in political campaigns, as I said, the peace movement, um, uh, peace now in Israel has shifted from talking about peace, now it's in their name, okay, peace now, from talking about peace to talking about things like arrangement, hesder, or settlement, liyashev, liyashev et asichsuch, and things like that. Um, the, the word peace process, you hardly hear it anymore. Uh, when I was in Jerusalem, just I came back from from a visit uh, in Jerusalem about three weeks ago. I met there with the UN envoy to the to Israel Palestine to the Israeli Palestinian uh, conflict, and uh, I thought it was really interesting and, and somewhat um, kind of archaic, if you will, that his title still carries the the the, the words uh, peace process. He's the UN envoy to the peace process while nobody anymore talk, talks about the peace process. Not about the peace and not about the process. <laughs> and so um, peace, interestingly, has also disappeared from popular culture in Israel. While you had in the past a lot of songs, you know, popular songs about peace and uh, films that dealt with the issue and uh, art and, and, you know, plastic art and things like that, you don't see that anymore. It's just not there as a as a content, even even in art. Um, I, I shouldn't, it's not at all. But but very seldom do you see that content playing out in in popular culture and in art. Um, on the Palestinian side, a similar process. I'm talking today about more about Israel, so I I won't elaborate about the Palestinians. But I'm happy to, if you want later, we can talk about it. Um, a loss of trust in diplomacy and a lot of loss of trust in the Palestinian Authority, which really put all its money. I mean, that that was their big uh, the big thing was that they were going to deliver a Palestinian state through diplomacy with Israel. Uh, that failed. Uh, there is a um, the, the the approval ratings for both Mahmoud Abbas, the president, and for the Palestinian Authority as an institution is 
very, very low, sometimes at the teens. It's really, it's terrible. Um, the Oslo process, uh, the Oslo negotiations were perceived as uh, causing more damage to Palestinians than benefit. And again, that's steady in public opinion polls of the Palestinians that were taken in the past two decades or so. Um, a real surge in support for armed struggle. Now it's in the 70% or something like that, which is really high. I remember during the Oslo years and even further, uh, it was in the teens, 20s, something like that. Now it's, it's the, when people are asked, what is your preferred mode or preferred path to resisting Israeli occupation, armed struggle comes out, comes, comes as first. Um, and the objective uh, of the younger generation, particularly in, in the West Bank and Gaza, again, this is all based on, on um, many, many uh, public opinion polls, when people are asked what, what should the struggle focus on, the Palestinian struggle, more and more people, and with the younger generation, it's a majority, uh, would say rights, human rights, not so much civil rights, but human rights. And statehood comes in and for, as first or something, as, as second or something like that. Now, for me, having covered Palestinian affairs in the 80s and 90s, statehood was was it that what this was the issue and when i talk to young palestinians i often tell them you know i know your parents uh, not necessarily there but i know your parents generation and i know how much they've sacrificed for having a state of their own and it 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 kind of uh, amazes me how um nonchalantly sometimes they would be saying ah statehood you know it's it's unattainable we can't achieve it therefore we're going for rights we're fighting for rights um, and uh, what, what else you see there is a, a very, very strong campaign to resist normalizing relations with Israel, including Israeli society, including people in Israeli society who are um, advocates of peace with the Palestinians. As long as you are not a, um, as, as long as you, you have not sort of anchored yourself or, or associated yourself with the Palestinian struggle to rid itself of the, of the occupation and to attain rights um, in, in a public way, um, many of the young Palestinians would not want to do anything with you. And that's again something that, I, that hurts me very much. I understand it, but I, I, I at least personally, I think it's a mistake. Um, Again, in terms of attitudes, is that on both sides, the, um, the win-win consensus attitude of the Oslo years, where uh, a, um, uh, an agreement seemed like a win for both sides, near uh, near has, now, has now given way to uh, a zero-sum approach. Um, you know, whatever concessions we make or whatever is, uh, uh, is whatever we uh, uh, sacrifice uh, would be a gain for the other side, um, and 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 that's uh, you know again uh, something that I, I think is is terrible. Um, and you have people in the uh, in the Israeli government. You know, if you take uh, Bezalel Smotrich, who's now the minister responsible for the West Bank. Um, he's like the minister of the occupation, if you will, on civilian affairs, not, not military. Um, his plan, his big you know, political plan and vision um, talks about obliterating Palestinian nationalism. It's not only uh, you know, more settlements or, um, you know, or something like that. It's, he actually views it as a goal to do away with, with the national movement of the Palestinians. Um, again, the, the real um, and and so there's there's a kind of a mutual delegitimization of the other's national aspirations on both sides, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, I thought that it was a really interesting way of 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 showing uh, kind of tangibly um, there must be a uh, factory somewhere, maybe in China, 
that makes little pendants of the map of Palestine or Eretz Israel, whatever you want to call it. And uh, people on both sides wear it. So you see Palestinians with a map and Israelis with a map. It's a map that shows the whole enchilada, the whole thing. There are variations on it. So as you can see on the right, uh, that's the you know kind of more Israeli variation with the Star of David on the Palestinian side with the colors of the Palestinian flag. But the map is the same map. It's this kind of dagger-shaped map of um, uh, Eretz Israel for the Israelis and Palestine for the Palestinians. And it's the whole, the whole thing without showing the West Bank and Gaza. And, and I, I thought it was really interesting that uh, kind of an, an interesting little anecdote. Um, so um, that's, the, that's, the, that's where we are. And that's the challenge that the movement in Israel is facing. And um, the question is, where is hope? OK, so what I have here, this is uh, one of my favorite uh, photos uh, that I actually took. Uh, I was standing in, in downtown DC one day, and I looked down at this young lady's um, foot. And on, the, on, the, on her foot is tattooed what is supposed to be, I don't know how many of you read Arabic, but it's supposed to say, Hunaka Amal, which means there is hope. But when I looked better at it, it it's a it's a uh, it's a typo. You know, to have a tattoo with a typo. And and what the what it actually says is there is boredom. Boredom. So so um, if if hope is, you know, I heard somewhere, I really like this kind of definition of hope, uh, that hope is desire uh, multiplied by expectation. Until recently, um, you know, both were low, uh, both the desire and the expectation. In other words, the desire for peace and the expectation that there will be peace, that it's viable, that it's doable. And um, the question is whether both of those can be, whoops, uh, sorry, what's happening here, can be resurrected. Um, and so, First, in terms of the, of the expectation, um, if you look at things that Israel has done, now, many people would, I should say, many people would say, you can't expect this to happen because it's so difficult. If the government of Israel cannot remove one settlement, how is it going to remove all those settlements, which would be a prerequisite for an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement? And I, I agree, I, it's, 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 a, it's a huge challenge and I, I don't see it happening. But, I do see other things that the Israeli government and Israeli society has managed to do. Water is one of them, which I think is just, is just amazing and really inspires me. Israel faced a terrible, terrible water crisis. I remember very well, 12 or 13 years ago, I, I was visiting my parents' and at some point I was taking a shower, and at some point my father was still alive at the time, you know, knocks on the shower door and says, what are you doing in there? And I said, taking a shower. He says, how long? Don't you know what the situation is in the country? And, you know, hurry up or turn off the water when you're not, when you're, when you're soaping yourself and so on. Um, in the course of a little more than a decade, Israel has completely overhauled its water crisis, uh, over, over, overcome its water crisis. And uh, from a terrible deficit that it had at the time, it now has a sur surplus. Israel exports water to Jordan. And all this was done with technology, uh, desalination. I think that, that, that now somewhere around 70, 75%, something like that. Um, no, 80% <laughs> of Israel's domestic and industrial consumption of water uh, comes from desalination plants. That's a huge undertaking, and it's something that um, that you know that Israel was able to do, and it's it's a vital thing. Uh, I see, you know, peace with the Palestinians obviously is a vital thing. So I say to myself, you know, if Israel if Israel was hap was able to do that, it can do great things. There are also other things that Israel did, which I think are incredibly impressive. Oslo, okay, so some people will say no, Oslo was not a, such a success. Fine. Um, there's a trash site outside of Tel Aviv. People know it as Chiria. Um, it was a place that I knew very well because I used to hitchhike there as a soldier. I would stand by there to 
um, you know, to hitchhike back home. And the smell was, was unbearable. And uh, right next to Khiria is Ben Gurion Airport. And I used to think to myself, you know, here's the airport, the <laughs> gates to the world, and right next to it is this horrible, horrible trash site. Well, the trash site, as you can see in this, in this photo, was turned into a national park. Uh, interestingly, curiously named after uh, Ariel Sharon, the former prime minister. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a wonderful place. It's really wonderful. It's, it's, I, I visited there, uh, you know, just uh, incredible. LGBT rights. Um, I had a brother who was, uh, was gay growing up in, in uh, or uh, was, he was in, in Jerusalem, a, a gay teenager in Jerusalem. And what he had to deal with, I, I won't even go into. It used to be that, that uh, gay, the gay community in, his, in Israel had a very, very hard time. Today, you know, gay pride parades, both in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem, Israeli society has completely changed, transformed its attitude toward the gay community. And this is in a society that has a very large portion that is religiously conservative. And even there you see a, a very significant change in attitudes. Um, I can go on, but what I'm trying to say is that both big, pro big national projects and attitudes have changed in Israel. Um, and so I think it can happen. It's, it's something that is, that is possible. And the biggest thing that is happening now, which really gives me the most hope, is Israel's protest movement. And um, to me, the protest movement is real proof, you know, tangible proof that Israelis are not indifferent, you know, aloof to, um, to, to public affairs and detached from public life, which was the impression, and I think was a correct impression up until just recently. For, for many years, Israelis didn't care that much about uh, public affairs and particularly, uh, which is, okay, never mind. Never, didn't, didn't care that much about public affairs. Uh, they went to vote because it's something that Israelis do, and they and they and thank, thankfully they do it in in, a, in very large percentages, particularly when compared to the United States. Um, but there was no broad protest, except for one wave, um, uh, which which had to do with the price of uh, you know. Uh, uh, the, the the prices at the supermarket, cottage cheese people called it, um, around, when was it, uh, 2013, 2014, something like that. Um, there wasn't, you know, this the, the kind of, of, of movement that we see now. And what we do see now for the, I think, 24th week going, Israelis going out to demonstrate in the hundreds of thousands. It's It's amazing. It's really amazing. And so this protest movement um, gives me hope also because it, you see it everywhere. It's not just in the public square in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem, but all around the country. There was one, uh, when, I, when I was in Israel, there was one um, uh, Saturday night when um, a friend told me that there were 135 separate places around the country where people went out to demonstrate. Um, and the issue of the occupation, anti-occupation uh, protesting, really is, is a, is, has been normalized as a protest item, as one of the agenda items of the protest. Now, it's not the leading item, it's not the main thing, and some people are trying to shy away from it. I'm, I'm aware of all that. But still, it's been accepted and even to a large extent embraced. I went to two uh, demonstrations in Jerusalem where it was clear that all the participants, you know, embraced the, the, um, the anti-occupation protesters. Um, it has become linked in people's minds to the um, democracy agenda that is leading the, the protest movement. And um, it is perceived by, I think, most of, of, of those protesters as, a, as something that is important um, Zionistically, if you will, as a kind of a Zionist imperative, as something that you should do if you really care about 
the Zionist project about the state of Israel. Um, now, I'd also like to mention something else that gives me hope, and that is that despite the fact that things are very, very bad on the Palestinian side, the Palestinian Authority, there's, there's a lot of crisis there, um, which have to do with, again, I can go into it later if you'd like, still, um, while there is great, a great deal of um, distrust in the viability of a two-state solution, you do see that uh, it's still very much embraced uh, internationally as the uh, option, as the uh, preferred solution to the, to the conflict. Um, it's very much still the same in people's consciousness uh, in both, on, on both sides, Israelis and Palestinians. And on the ground, which to me is the most important, you still see Palestinian state institutions being built. Um, again, it's not the kind of pace that I would like to see. There's a lot of um, corruption involved and so on, but still you do see uh, state in institutions being uh, built even, even now. Um, and maybe one last thing that I would say that gives, me, that gives me hope is that at least on the Israeli side, but I, I also see some of it on the Palestinian side, you do see quite a bit of creativity regarding solutions. Okay, so if people perceive the two-state solution as having lost momentum and maybe not being viable anymore, there is um, quite a bit of intellectual creativity in trying to look for either other ideas uh, or uh, variations on the two-state solution. Um, so that's, that, that, that brings me to, to the end of my uh, presentation. I, I wanted to end it with, with this kind of note of hope, but I would like to, as a kind of a, uh, you know, just to, to sum things up, to say that uh, I'm realistic. And although I do have hope and uh, I, I'm a hopeful person in, in nature, um, this is one of the lowest uh, points that we have, we have been in. We've seen uh, since Israeli-Palestinian, since, since the occupation, since 1967, um, it is not a hopeful time overall, but I think there is still enough sources, enough reasons for hope there for people to not give up on the, on the struggle for Israeli-Palestinian peace. And again, I, I'm ending my, my uh, presentation with the word peace because I think that, it, that we should still talk about peace and not just about arrangements, interim arrangements and so on, but really adhere to the goal of a real peace and further, you know, in the future, reconciliation uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. So I'll end here. Um, you have my, you're really welcome. And I, I'm saying this, uh, you know, I, when I talk to students, I always say that my talks come with a lifetime guarantee. Um, <laughs> to you, I say the same. You're welcome to write to me. I will I always uh, answer uh, emails. And you're welcome to visit our, our website, Americans for Peace Now. Thank you. You're open to questions. Yes, definitely. Uh, identify somebody and I'll in the okay, mic. Sure. Um, so let's start with this table over there and we, we can just, yeah, we can go around the table. There are several people over there who want to ask. Thank you for a very comprehensive I presentation. You too. Um, I have a two part, like any Jew, I have a two part question. Um, and, and the, the latter is maybe for Rabbi Zemel. I hate to put him on the spot. But um, in 1978, I was the Eisendrath intern for the Religious Action Center, which is the National Office of Reform Judaism. And David Saperstein said to me, I was a member of Bray Ra, which was an American Jewish group that believed in a two-state solution. And David Saperstein said to me, you know, Amy, um, when we criticize Israel, we know we love Israel too, but when you talk to the non-Jewish Americans, when 
they're not loving Israel. So you've got to be very careful what you say. So my two part question is, um, how does the Isra what does the Israeli peace movement want from the American Jewish community? And my second question for Rabbi Zimmel is, <laughs> um, when I left being an intern for the Religious Action Center, I interviewed for a job with the National Council of Jewish Women. Um, and the person who interviewed me said, um, we'd like to hire you, but you have to resign from Brera. And I'm wondering, where is the American Jewish institutions now on being able to support a two-state solution. Rabbi Zemel, would you like to take the second question first and, and then I will, so microphone? Or you? Rabbi Zemel, I'm, I'm going to answer your, I'm not going to answer your question, but I'm going to say one thing. There are two, in terms of institution, legacy institutions, as they're known in, in general in American Jewish life, there are two that are unashamedly progressive. One of them is the Central Conference of American Rabbis, the Reform Rabbinical Organization, and the second is the National Council of Jewish Women for the entire history. So the fact that in 1978, the NCJW did not, did not want someone who was associated with Brera on their staff means how totally, at that point, um, outside the boundary, Brera was viewed. Because NCJW, if you look at any issue of social action, of political action for the last 50 years, or for sure, 40 years that I've been here on any single social political agenda issue, there have always been two organizations that have been in the front on the Jewish side. Sometimes the Union for Reform Judaism wasn't with the CCAR, the NCJW always was. So that gives an indication of, of how far the thing has moved from 1978. Uh, so I'm just going to give one little commercial that I hate to interrupt you because I so want to thank you for being here, Ori. It's, you're, you're wonderful to be here. On June 29th, there's a flyer on our table, and the flyer on many tables, we're hosting a speaker from Breaking the Silence. And unfortunately, the Breaking the Silence logo is not on the flyer. And, and the speaker is going to address exactly what Ori has it touched on here on one of the slides how the current pro-democracy demonstrations are related to the occupation. Um, so I just want to give a little commercial, but also reinforce. Thank you so much. Thanks, and, and it's it's a good segue. Yeah, um, a good segue to answer your your other question, and that is what what does the Israeli peace movement and its American um, allies we uh, expect from, from American Jews. You know, if you ask me that question, let's say seven months ago or eight months ago, I would say um, support on, in the American scene in advancing uh, the agenda of Israeli-Palestinian peace, uh, meaning uh, talking to your elected officials and so on and so forth. I, I would now add to it, and maybe even put it first as, as a first goal, um, solidarity with the Israeli uh, protest movement, because the challenge that we're seeing from the current Israeli government, the challenge to Israeli democracy, to the very character of the, of the state of Israel, is, um, is a burning challenge. It, it's, 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 you know, the occupation has a cre is a kind of a creeping challenge uh, that gradually creeps and, and, and damages, as, as, as far as I see it, the character of the state of Israel. It's slow. What is happening now with this government is a much, much more immediate challenge. So I would say first, solidarity with the protest movement, uh, and second, um, playing the role in the American arena in advancing the agenda of Israeli-Palestinian peace. Uh, please. Uh Give uh, Ari your name before you ask. Did you have your hand up? No. Yeah. Uh, I get a quick question. Name. What what 
Phil, oh, Phil Levine, um, what should, what do you see the United States' role in, in the process? Um, because obviously they took a very heavy role at, at one point and have now backed away and and what do you see and how how is that help would that be helpful or not helpful to the process um as i see it and you'd probably hear it from from other you know i don't want to put myself in in the category of experts but what you'd hear from the experts on israeli palestinian and israeli israeli american relations and so on is that without American involvement, active American involvement in advancing this agenda, things will not happen. And uh, I am unfortunately very disappointed. I, sh I say it, uh, you know, uh, like that, very disappointed with, it, with the Biden administration for not being more active. The Biden administration took a posture that I can understand because it has other international um, uh, priorities of doing things behind the scenes, of having an, a conversation uh, you know, with, with Israel, with the Israeli government behind the scenes, and trying to put the brakes on Israeli uh, government initiatives as they per pertain to the occupation, mainly settlements. It's not working. It's just not working. The day after Israel officially and publicly, this was just last week, um, committed to not advance the E1 uh, project. I don't know how many of you know, this is a corridor between Jerusalem, northern Jerusalem, and Adumim in the West Bank. If Israel builds a settlement there, it completely breaks the contiguity, uh, northeast contiguity in the West Bank, and really um, makes the creation of a future Palestinian state virtually impossible. A day after Netanyahu said, under American pressure, that he will halt E1, um, he announced, uh, no, it was not announced officially yet, but it was published and there was no, it, it's, it's true, uh, that the Israeli government has, uh, is going to advance a new plan for 4,000 housing units and settlements in the West Bank. Without a continuous, committed, uh, public U.S. campaign to stop settlement activity, in order to keep the, the path open to a future Palestinian state, with, to a future two-state solution, um, this government can make the current situation irreversible and not allow for a two-state solution. Many people think that the two-state solution is out the door and, and that it's, it's not possible anymore anyway. I, I think it still is possible, but I think that this government definitely has the capability and definitely, without a doubt, has the motivation to do away with the two-state solution. So I would really love for the Biden administration to be more um, active, more public. I can give more examples of things that it can do in order to advance a two-state solution. If, if people want, I can, I can go into it now, but I want to allow uh, uh, other, other questions as well. Um, how, how are we doing with time? Uh, till about 10 to 2. OK. So maybe we'll take other questions, and then if people want yeah. to circle back to it, I'm willing. Um, maybe here in the front, we have two two people in this in this table. So. We'll ask them to do first. to do it out. Right. I was just wondering what children on the two sides are being taught today. Okay, and maybe I'll take one more, the other question. And I can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm David Diskin. My question is, these current protests, which are, are amazing, I mean, I talk to a, a friend of mine in Ashdod every week, who, and he and his wife go every week. <clears throat> Do you see them as a catalyst for finally re-examining all the problems of Israeli society, whether it's conflicts between religious and non-religious, the inequality of Israeli Arabs, et, et cetera? I'll start with, with, with the second question. Uh, the answer is no, I don't. And I, I asked friends, I have several friends who are very, very active, some of them among the leaders of this movement. I asked that question and categorically, the immediate answer was no. That's not the, that's not the objective, at least for now. But things sometimes have a uh, dynamic of their own and that's where my hope lies. 
they told me that it's a it's a far-fetched hope i have to you know i want to be uh, honest but again you know you have to hope and so i i'm i'm hoping that um in the future there will be a kind of a momentum to this new phenomenon in israeli society of things being taken to the street and of people showing their passion um to to address uh, other issues one of the problems is that you know while while advocating for democracy and demonstrating against uh, the attempt to um gnaw at democracy as this government is trying to do is can be can be easily packaged into uh, a demonstration into slogans you go to the streets and you say democratia the other issues you know israeli uh, uh, jewish arab relations inside israel the israeli palestinian conflict um relations between uh, ultra orthodox and secular in israel uh, and so on and so forth the socioeconomic issues are so much more complicated that it, it would be it would really be difficult and there would have to be a real switch so um to put it i don't think so <laughs> um to your question about what israeli uh, kids are being taught uh, and israeli and palestinian kids are being taught um it's it's a it's a long uh, uh it's it's a complicated issue and unfortunately on both sides i think that the uh the trajectory is not positive having said that i, I want to say and this is something that i've written about before i think there's too much attention being given to the curriculum i think that while the curriculum is important and it's something that is measurable you can go back and look exactly what's in there in the lives of particularly Palestinians, but I think also Israelis, what they're taught in the classroom is has little impact on their Weltanschauung, on their on their you know worldview, on how they perceive their relationship with Israelis, what they do about it. Um, what they're taught on the street uh, is much more uh, important and impactful, and there, you know, if I said that things are negative or, or, or not on, on a good trajectory when it comes to what they're taught at school, what they're taught on the street uh, is even worse. So that's my, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, yes, over there, please. There's a lady in, in that, yeah. Um, anybody else have a phone that's on? Please check it. Jean Steckler, um, with, with the Abraham Accords, we were, led to believe that the, the Arabic nations were not necessarily aligned with the Palestinian state. We were, I, I was thinking, you know, I was, my, in my interpretation of the news at the time was that Saudi Arabia also was not aligned with the Palestinian state, but that seems to have changed. Do you know what the relationship is now with Saudi Arabia and the Palestinian state? Right. Um, I, I'm going to answer it. Uh, I, I feel that I'm shortchanging people because I'm not giving you the guy. These are all issues that one could give a whole lecture about and so on. Um, when it comes to, there, there, first of all, uh, you can't lump all the states that Israel has, has formed um, formal diplomatic relations with into one camp, into one group. It's, it really varies. Um, what we've heard, however, from Saudi Arabia, and I think because Saudi Arabia views itself as a leader, if not the most important leader at the moment of the Arab world, um, Saudi Arabia is committed uh, formally and has been for many years to not go the route of the UAE and Morocco and you know the other countries that have uh, uh, formed uh, diplomatic relations with Israel before the Palestinian issue was resolved. And apparently, that's something that was said by a, a, a Saudi official. I just saw a headline yesterday, and I haven't even you know read the whole thing. But apparently, a, a spokesperson for the Saudi Foreign Ministry actually said it in so many words, and I think I think they mean it. So my sense is that uh, although I know that Israel and the Biden administration are trying to advance toward uh, Israeli-Saudi relations in the short run, you know, before the Palestinian issue is addressed, 
I don't think it's going to happen. Um, yes, here, please. Thank you. Give us your name, please. Uh, I'm Graham Wilder, um, and I just got back from my semester in Israel, and I remember one, one of the friends I made there who was like an Israeli who made Aliyah um, like 10 years ago or something. She says, or I was just walking back from class, and I saw her, and I was like, how are you doing? And she said, oh, I'm fine, but I'm in that Israeli days again. And I just thought that was such an interesting... Days like with a Z, D-A-Z-E? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and I just thought like a, as a phrase to encapsulate being stuck in the moment where so many of us are just kind of p p pondering the conflict as a whole, as opposed to as you know, millions of individual instances that come up to create this. And the instances, I think, are what become a daze because when, when, when an Israeli person gets tra 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 traumatized or ha has to bear witness to something they don't want to, it becomes part of this communal not spoken about days and I, I'm just wondering what's your take on that and and how would that impact the peace process going forward it's it's a it's a great question and it's something that applies to both Israelis and Palestinians and that is the impact of the traumas those are both traumatized societies Some people refer to them as post-traumatic and I say no not post traumatic they're they're still carrying with them the trauma the traumas respectable respective of the of the two peoples uh the holocaust and uh the 1948 uh, uh nakba for the palestinians and and furthermore which is more important than that goes into this you know like the days i can see a palestinian saying that i'm in, in a days in 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 that sense um things that happen to them today are being viewed through that prism and politicians you know uh um demagogic demagogical politicians know how to use that and to to take advantage of that kind of prism so um i think you put your finger in something that is that is very important and that to the best of my understanding actually has not been addressed in any of the negotiations that have taken place between Israelis and Palestinians before. And I spoke with people who participated, both Israelis and Palestinians, in the negotiations. And um, while there was an attempt during uh, Camp David, um, Yasser Arafat and uh, uh, Barak, to talk about this and to try to see if there's any kind of uh, way to um not so much agree but to to reach some kind of an understanding on the two narratives and very quickly and i think that that kind of lingered to the negotiations between uh, olmert and, and abu mazen later on uh they understood that it's unbridgeable that you, you can't talk about those things and and reach some kind of an understanding regarding national narratives um which which has a lot of impact on on the two societies I'm, i i really don't I'm, i don't have time to go into it it would be interesting i think for people in that context to listen to uh a podcast episode that i did we have a, po a podcast that the americans for peace now this is my baby i've been doing this for seven seven years now and the latest one was about um attitudes in the israeli public what happens to a society israeli society that has been in conflict for so many years and uh the speaker there professor daniel bartal who's like the leading authority on these issues uh talks about that so i would recommend that if you have time our, our next webinar that will also turn into a podcast episode which will take place tomorrow uh we'll talk about uh the 1948 nakba um 
uh, uh, trauma and how it impacts and Palestinian society and lingers to these days. And it will come through two, um, two professors who have become good friends, uh, a, an American Jew or a Canadian Jew and a Palestinian American. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have time tomorrow around noon, at noon, I should say, if not, it'll be on our, on our uh, podcast and you can just listen to it. Um, more questions, let's see. So maybe we'll take three together, just because I'm looking at the time and I, so let's take three together and then uh, we'll see if we have more time left. Does that sound good? Yeah, so right, right there. Yeah, my name is Andy Narva. Um, I'd actually like to recommend a book called We Are Not One, uh, which really documents the last 60 years of the American Jewish uh, discussion of Israel. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of wondering, though, uh, the Israelis don't really seem to care what American Jews think. And um, I wonder what you think, I, and I wonder what our role is, uh, because clearly, the generation younger than us is just turning away and is indifferent to Israel. Um, if there's some role perhaps in challenging some American Jewish organizations, which although they may be generally progressive, continue to line up right behind Israel, including, for example, the uh, Anti-Defamation League. Um, I don't know what you think the strategy should be for people in this room and our friends. Yeah. Um, let's see. Maybe here and here. Yeah, so the two gentlemen. We have time. Wait, wait. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. So I'd like to ask you um, when I first read about the Abraham Accords, my sense was that they asked the Palestinians, not the other Arab states, but the Palestinians to relinquish their claim for self-determination in exchange for communal economic benefits. Aid. Did I miss something? Okay, and then the gentleman over there also had a question. Is that your moment? Um, Ed Grossman, sort of two sort of fast related questions. One is, what is the role of, of a tech technology and especially the shared technological community that the young people are participating in and if not a two-state solution where are people looking because it looks like that has gotten very close to the point as you've demonstrated okay maybe we'll take one more question here and then uh, we'll wrap it up yeah on the tail of the last question Excuse that. let me say your name how please Hillel Levine. Let me say, how many people here understand what happened in Haifa Bay in the last few months? How many billions of dollars it's, it's going for sale? What, what's, what's going on? Do we understand any of these technological issues? I'm happy that you mentioned water, because firstly, that was done largely by American Jews. But secondly, it seems like a small thing, but it's a big thing. I've worked in the last few years on disaster preparedness. I have been working in Jericho, Joshua and the walls of Jericho, trying to prepare Israelis for possible uh, disasters that they might escape. Um, there are lots of things that we're overlooking in terms of potential. And thank you for all the good things you've done. Thank you, um, totally agree. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll address the questions. Let's see. First of all, technology. Um, I'll say maybe I'll say a few, just a, qu a quick, a few quick words about the role of technology, and I think that that uh, mainly has to do with social networks. Uh, social. Ne I don't know if this is what you were aiming at, but the role of social networks in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has become fascinating it's something that i'd love to sink my teeth into and maybe do a little bit of exploration in my podcast but uh it's uh it's there, there's a lot happening there that is both that both um 
reinforces the zero-sum dynamic that I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but also quite a few interesting things, interesting projects that reinforce uh, a more kind of win-win approach, uh, uh, what, would what would hopefully be in the future a, uh, a peaceful approach, a peace approach. Um, I, I, I just don't have the time to go further into other stuff, but if you, if, if you want to just quickly sharpen your questions about technology, I can maybe address it uh, real quick. Right. So the, the question, just for people who didn't hear, was uh, about um, the interest of high tech companies in uh, young talent, maybe from both sides, right? The, you're right, and that is happening, not enough on the Palestinian side. I really wish that there would be, uh, uh, you know, private global companies that would funnel more uh, resources to encourage uh, the, the Palestinian high tech industry. What has happened, however, and this is very important to uh, emphasize in the past uh, few months under this current Israeli government, is that uh, big high tech companies and entrepreneurs and um, um, venture capitalists have been pulling their resources because they view Israel as increasingly an instable place in terms of its government. Um, and so you need stability. One of the reasons why we don't see more investment on the Palestinian side is that it's deemed as less stable than Israel. Well, guess what? Now Israel too is being deemed, maybe not as unstable, but as less stable than it used to be. And, and that has a very cooling impact on um, economic development and, and particularly in the, in the field of high, high tech and, and you know, technology more broadly. Um, I don't, I, regarding the question about uh, Palestinians and courage to give up on, um, on, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, and, and national aspirations, no, I, I don't, I, I haven't, I don't think that that's the way it was, it was presented to them. That the, the, Trump, the Trump plan was presented that way. Oh, the, okay, the Trump plan was... Um, again, to be fair, I, I, I completely disagree with the Trump plan. I think that it was a non-starter and I have a lot to say about it, but I don't think that there was an actual um, explicit demand or expectation that they would give up on their national aspirations. There was an, a, uh, an expectation that they would accept, uh, embrace, a plan that did not answer the very minimal demands of their of their you know national uh, uh, expectations, but to give up on their national aspirations, I in, in exchange for um, uh, eco economic aid, I I don't think that that's a correct uh, framing. I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far. Um, regarding um, uh, the you know the, the role of Jewish organizations, particularly. Uh, mainstream Jewish organizations. Yes, I think that that's a very, very valuable uh, task that American Jews can uh, engage in uh, to to put pressure. And I think that that's something that you see working. I, I've seen proof that these things work. Um, to put pressure on American organizations such as American Jewish Committee and the ADL and the Conference of Presidents and so on, APAC, to take positions that are more Balanced, balanced, more fair, more uh, realistic uh, when it comes to Israel-Palestine, and particularly when it comes to the current um, objectives of the of the Israeli government. So I think it's worthwhile. I would very much encourage people to do that. Um, uh, I agree with uh, the, the the book that you pointed to. Uh, We're not one. Uh, again, if you go to our uh, podcast. There was an interview with the author, and uh, I would I would recommend that to you too. Um, in this round, did I did I miss something? Or did I address? I think I addressed everything. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you very very much. Um,
Thanks again for inviting me, particularly to my friend Barbara.